Uriah, uh, I thought it'd be good just to go back into narrative for a little while. Um, uh, we're going to begin uh, 1 Samuel, and it traces uh, God's work in Israel from the end of the time of Judges, Samuel is the last judge, uh, to the establishment of David, God's choice as king. And then 2 Samuel continues on David's uh, story. And this story begins, 1 Samuel, um, as many of the stories uh, of God raising up leaders for his name, it begins with a barren woman. Uh, many times through, through Genesis to Judges, we've seen women who suffered from barrenness. And, and here we're introduced to a woman named Hannah who joins them in, in her suffering. Um, and not only is this the birth narrative, chapter 1 is the birth narrative of Samuel, um, who would be the last judge of Israel, um, but he's a man used by God, a man used by God at a critical time in Israel's history. Um, in the account of Samuel's birth, whoop, uh, we also see not just the overarching narrative of God's work in Israel and what he's doing to bring them to or bring the king of his choice to them. Um, we also see just how the suffering of one of God's children is never in vain and how God will ultimately, if not in this life, but certainly in the next, he will comfort all of his people's suffering. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall what? be comforted. Yeah. Right now, as I said, we got a lot of people who are enduring a lot of trials, sickness, surgeries, loss of loved ones. The hurt and grief is real. Um, and we have to walk through that. But even in the pain of it all, our hope is real as well. Um, so as we take this text, we're going to take it First Samuel 1, we're going to take it a piece at a time. We're going to see God's comfort in our affliction as well as this birth narrative of God's work in Israel. Okay? Y'all are quiet. Everybody okay? Y'all doing good? All right. We're going to read it a piece at a time and just kind of soak in the narrative as we walk through it. So, there was a certain man, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, of Ramathaim Zophim. Say that five times real fast. Of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jer Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Panina. And Panina had children, but Hannah had no children. So, basically, first two verses, we're just introduced to this family. Elkanah has two wives, a fruitful wife, bearing him sons and daughters, I assume, and a barren wife, unable to do so. Now, remember, in those days... So fruitfulness, being able to bear children, uh, was highly valued. In fact, it could be said that it was seen as the wife's main job. And because of this, uh, we've seen this all through, you know, uh, Rebecca and uh, Sarah and all of the uh, narrative of the early chapters of the Bible. Barrenness is seen as a curse or an affliction. It's a cause of suffering in, in uh, these women because of... Um, the value, be fruitful and multiply, that was placed upon bearing lots of children, bearing big, big families. Uh, and, and surely Hannah, as we walk through this chapter, she felt the weight of this suffering. This is going to be the, probably the intent of the chapter, not just to announce Samuel's birth, but also to show uh, the suffering of Hannah. That seems to be the focus of the text all the way through uh, chapter 1. Um, she felt the weight of it, and it brought her to despair, as we'll see in a moment. But she was also a blessed woman, because despite her condition, uh, which many husbands would have disdained in their wives in these days, Elkanah, her husband, loved her deeply and was a faithful, godly man. How do I know that? Because, <coughs> excuse me, verses 3 through 5 says this, Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to uh, 
Panina or Panina, however you want to say it, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. He's talking about the sacrificial meat of the sacrificial meal. They would go to the feast, they would worship, they would sacrifice, and then they would have a sacrificial meal uh, there in the city with all of uh, the people. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. Why? Because he loved her, and look at it, he loved her even though the Lord had closed her womb. So we know he was a godly man because he went every year to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord. Shiloh was where the tabernacle was being kept at this time. In Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 16, 16, uh, the law of Moses required that Israelites make regular trips to the tabernacle to worship um, and Shiloh was where it was at. So his obedience in going every year and his faithfulness to God, it's all the more profound when you realize the state of the nation at this time. This, time, this is taking place during the time of judges. Samuel, as I said, will be the last judge. What was the nation of Israel like during the time of the judges? That's exactly correct. It's the theme of the book of Judges. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. It was a time of continual rebellion. The people were continually in Judges. Uh, there's a cycle that goes on. The people forsake the law and worship other gods. And then God would turn them over to their oppressors and they would, be, they would be persecuted and oppressed by other nations. And then in that oppression, they would repent and they would call out to God for deliverance. God would raise up a judge who would deliver them. And once they were delivered, what would they do? They go right back into idolatry, into unfaithfulness. And the cycle would start all over again with all the judges. And so... In the midst of this time, when everybody did what was right in their own eyes, you hear have a man who is faithful to obey God, going up to worship him as he's commanded to do so. And his godliness is made even more stark as the writer breaks in to kind of the narrative to mention that Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons, were the priests of the Lord at that time. So as 1 Samuel progresses, we're going to see these two sons of Eli. They're notoriously wicked and continually leading the people astray. Later in 1 Samuel, it says they were sleeping with the women that would come to sacrifice. And they were, they were taking the best parts of the sacrifice for themselves uh, against the law of God. They were incredibly wicked. And the, the narrative is going to chastise Samuel for not, for not uh, stopping them in their wickedness. So the fact that this man, Elkanah, led his family... In righteousness and faithfulness is in stark contrast to almost everybody else in the land who was doing what was right in their own eyes, including the priesthood at the time who was wicked. But not only is his godliness seen in his love and uh, uh, in his love for God and his worship of God, his obedience to God in the midst of this culture all around him, but his godliness is seen in his love and devotion to his wife even though she couldn't produce any children for him. That's why the text says he gave her a double portion because he loved her even though the Lord had closed her womb. When he sacrificed, when he went yearly to the sacrifice, to the feast, he would give food to all of his family, of course, as they ate of the sacrificial meal, but he gave double portion to Hannah because he loved her. Um, he cared for her when a, a lot of other husbands in this time would have disdained her for not being able to do what they valued most, produce children. Uh, the text says it this way because of that reality. He loved her even though the Lord had closed her womb. Now, though Hannah might have taken some solace in the fact that her husband really and truly loved her like a, a godly husband must do, um, was devoted to her. She had another thorn in her side in addition to being uh, unable to have children and it added to her suffering. Anybody know what it is? Other wife. Yeah, the other wife. Yeah. Funny how that always works like that. And her... Uh, it's just a joke. Don't send me no emails. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate... Would it help if I just read the whole chapter and then went back? Or were you all good? Doesn't matter? Okay. Grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. 
Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. So being barren was bad enough, but having Panina or Panina rubbing it in her face must have been intolerable. And the text shows us that this ridicule, um, this provocation, it calls it, um, it was probably just continuous, I would imagine, all the time. But it specifically happened every year when they went up to worship at Silo. Year by year. That's the point that he's trying to make is that every year when we went, she would provoke her. She would rub it in her face so that she couldn't even eat this sacrificial meal that they were called to eat together during their worship. And you can imagine just how those dinners went, you know. Panina would say, or Panina, whatever. She'd say, oh, Elkanah, you're so dear. Thank you so much for the food for all me and my children. Hannah, do all your children have enough food? You know? Or she would say, calm down, children. Don't be so rowdy. Let's not be too loud. Hannah's not used to having children all around. You know? She would provoke her. I thought it was funnier than that, but okay, whatever. <laughs> I, had to, I had to work hard to come up with that, and I got nothing. Every year, as they would travel to worship in Shiloh and sacrifice to the God um, that they worshipped and eat the sacrificial meal, it was a time when this wife took to provoke and irritate and scorn, whatever, Hannah. Uh, it was occasion when she was ridiculed, when her childlessness was highlighted. So how do you think... Hannah would have felt every year as the time approached that it's time to go and worship and obey God and go to Shiloh. How do you think she would have felt? Yeah, you think she would have dreaded it? Like, I know I'm supposed to go. I know we're supposed to worship. I know my heart's supposed to be focused on God. But I also know that as soon as we step foot out the door and we're on the road to Shiloh, I'm going to start hearing it. And when we sit down to eat the sacrificial feast uh, of this time of worship and praise, I'm going to be at a table with uh, at least a bunch of people who uh, are making fun of me or provoking me or scorning me or whatever they were doing to really irritate her and, um, and um, ridicule her for not having children. It would have made... I mean, if I put myself in her position, it would have made, it would have made me not want to go, wouldn't it? Not want to worship, not wanting to, you know, to spare herself. So, do you think this might have, in any other circumstance, it doesn't happen here, but do you think it might colored her view of God in any way? When not only are you suffering, but you got this constant nag next to you that's nagging you and ridiculing you and poking you every time. Do you think that could have, could have, it didn't, we'll see it in a minute, but do you think that could have colored how she viewed God? Because it, year by year, every time they go to worship, this happens. And how would it have done so? What do you think? Put yourself in her position. How would you, how would you be, what would your prayer sound like if you were in this position? You'd be questioning God, sure. Yeah, why do you allow this? Not only the suffering, but also the continual ribbing. But it doesn't. And that's really remarkable. As we're working through Hebrews, so you see the Hebrew Christians that are suffering, uh, they're being tempted. They're wavering back and forth. Should, should we still follow Jesus or should we just go back to the old way? Because we're, we're suffering for his name and it's, it's hard. Um, Hannah's barrenness and the ribbing that she keeps getting from the other wife, it definitely caused her pain and suffering so much that she wouldn't eat the sacrificial meal because of all of her weeping. You know, when it's time to go and worship the Lord at this feast and this joyous time, the sacrifice is given, it's made ready, it's provided for the family, and she didn't even eat of it because she was weeping the whole time. But in the midst of her grief and her despair, you've got to remember, her husband really did love her. He was a godly man, and he tries to comfort her. In verse 8, it says, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? 
And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? So he knows why she doesn't have any children. And she can't have any children. So that's why he says, am I not worth more? It's clear from this, though, to me anyway, that he truly loves her deeply. Despite the shame that she felt, he loved her. He spoke kindly to her. He sees her suffering. Um, Having sons or having children was not the measure of her worth in his eyes. Um, So you have this you have this blessing and suffering at the same time. Hannah is childless, of course, and it's clear that she sees it as um, uh, not shameful, but suffering and is suffering because of it. And she's got the other wife over here who's making it worse. But she also has a husband and he loves her and he's he's trying to um, comfort her. But ultimately, it's, it's not from him that, that her comfort can be found. So at, at, as the stage is set in these verses, we see, number one, a man who's from all that we can see in the text is godly in every sense of the word. He, he leads his family to worship and obedience. He loves his wife with a true and tender love. And here you have a godly family living characteristically, uh, uncharacteristically godly in an in a ungodly nation at the time who did whatever was right in their own eyes. Um, I, I'm sure Hannah appreciated uh, and, and returned Elkanah's love and care, but he's just not able to ease her grief. He wasn't able to fix her suffering. And if this was actually happening at the sacrificial meal... I don't know why he wouldn't have just said, shut up, Panina. But the point, though, is this woman, Hannah, her suffering is manifold. And it is deep, and her grief is real, and it is down to the core of her being, where she, you know, she's weeping so much at this time that she doesn't even eat. Um, And... She does have a loving husband, but as much as he's trying, he can't fix it. He can't make it better. So we are to weep with those who weep. That's a good thing. We're to show love and care when others suffer. We know that only God can truly mend the heart and comfort those who mourn. So in Hannah's grief, her despair drives her not away from God as so often happens. But it drives her to God. And it's in her affliction and suffering that that is the prelude to this mighty work of God in Samuel. It says, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. So they'd just eaten the sacrificial meal. Now Eli the priest was sitting at the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. So they ate, and presumably after Elkanah tried to console her, she rose up from the table and went to the tabernacle to pour out her grief and her suffering heart to God. And the text tells us that Eli the priest, who would later be rebuked uh, by God for letting his wicked sons run wild, was the priest sitting at the door of the tabernacle. And in the deepest of sorrow and grief and suffering and affliction, she pours out her soul to the Lord at the door of the Lord's house. The way this is phrased in verse 10, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. You can feel the pain in how her prayer is described Uh, weeping bitterly. She called upon the Lord for help. And then in verse 11, it says, she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. She began giving glory to God as the Lord of hosts, O Lord of hosts, or Lord of armies, is what hosts means. She cried, asking that he would look upon her affliction and remember her. And she affirmed over and over again in her prayer that she was his servant. And vows, God, if you would give me a son, if you would provide a child, that she would give it back to the Lord. She'd give him back to the Lord. And she makes this vow. 
is this a case of bargaining with God? If you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. Is that what's going on here? I got some yeses and some noes. Kind of. Well, that's riding the fence. So, on the face of it, you got to say, yeah. But from the text, there is nothing sinful, shameful, wrong, or anything which, what, what she is doing here. Because you're going to see as it walks through the text. Um, I don't think it is the kind of bargaining that we think. So, what I mean is, most of the time when we bargain with God... Um, we're offering God something that he already is owed. Make sense? God, if you'll get me out of this suffering, if you'll remove this trial from me, I swear I will obey your every command. Well, you already owe that. If you'll get me out of this trial, I, I, I vow to you that I'll never commit this sin again. You already owe that too. You know, it's like, it's like my daughter coming and saying, listen, if you'll, you know, if you'll let me take the car to the store, I'll clean my room. Well, you already owe me that. That's not a bargain for me. <laughs> but here, Hannah's not, not doing that, I don't think. I could be wrong, and we can discuss it, but she's not saying, I will serve you if you give me a son. She's already said, I'm your servant no matter what. Uh, she's not saying, I will obey you more, or I will whatever, whatever. She's saying, if you give me this gift, and that's what it is, a gift, then I'll give the gift right back to you. You see the difference? Am I making too much out of that? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. He said, isn't this just another form of sacrifice? So, it is, but it's not at her cost. Well, I guess it is at her cost, I guess, wouldn't it? Because she is something that God himself is going to give her that she's giving back to the Lord. But I guess you could say that with pretty much everything, couldn't you? Hmm. What do you think? Somebody with some wisdom, share it. Huh? No, no. I didn't mean there was no wisdom in the previous comments. I mean, now since the, since the idea of this being a sacrifice has been raised, I, I don't know where I stand exactly. So I need somebody to help me. She wants a child really, really bad. Well, yeah, she wants a child really, really bad. Yeah, well, that's true. She said she really, really wants a child. And when, say that again. It was a lot in that now. That she wants a child real bad, and then, I mean, she's given to the point where she'll give it up, but she, I don't know, I see, I, yeah, I can't say it for more. Yeah, so I start thinking and I start talking, and then my mind goes, ah, oh, that may not be exactly right, does it? I mean, so there's more to it, right? So there's birthright uh, that, that he would have as one of all his sons. There's, um, like, security for her at all the number of past wedding to be a provider for her, so Hmm. Okay, Dustin said that there's more to it because uh, he, as a firstborn son, well, he, he may not be if he's, he's got another wife, but he would have inheritance rights. He would be uh, her security. If Elk and I were to die, uh, he would take care of her. So there's more to it going on than just giving him up. Is that right? Susan first, then Janet. Usually your sacrifices can't do more things for God. Oh. Usually your sacrifices can't do more things for God. So you mean he's going to actually grow up and be a man of God and a servant of God. It's a living sacrifice, not a dead one. I like that. Janet? I don't know about you all, but nine months pregnancy wasn't wonderful for me. You know, uh, so we got to think about that whole aspect of it too. She's giving up a, a time of her life of being pregnant. Childbirth Okay, y'all got that? It was a sacrifice of her time, her physicalness, and all that to be pregnant nine months and then 
promised to give the baby up to the Lord. Um, and I ought to make it clear as well, when, when she dedicates him to the Lord, it doesn't mean she's never going to see him again. She has access, you know, she go to Shiloh and, and see him. And, uh, so, but it's not going to, you know, he's going to live in Shiloh under the tutelage of Eli. So yeah, sacrificial. So yeah, any other comments, questions before we move on? Of course, of course. She, he said she recognizes that the Lord is the source of provision. And they, they all recognize that from the earlier statement where he said the Lord had closed her womb. So they understood that it was God who was the one who was in control of these things. And she indeed does uh, recognize that because she pours her heart out to God. She makes her request be made known, and essentially uh, she's vowing to glorify God with the gift that he, if he would give her that gift. So, uh, but it doesn't seem like, other than I will dedicate him to you, it doesn't seem like she makes any other stipulation, uh, like I will do better, I'll be better, I will live more faithfully, I will whatever, whatever. Uh, she is asking for a gift and vowing to give that gift back. So in a way, it is sacrificial, yes. Oh, sorry. I think it's interesting, though. You talk about like, not a lot of stipulations, but she does specifically ask for a son. She has no children at all. Hmm? She does ask specifically for a son rather than just, may I have any child? Yeah, that's true. I mean, so there's a little bit of stipulation. I want a kid, but I want a son. <laughs> yeah, I want a kid, but he's got to be the right kid. Yeah, you know, I mean, no, I hear you. I hear you. She, she said, if you didn't hear that, she said there is kind of a stipulation because she has no children, uh, but she specifically asks for a son. You know, I, I don't want just a child. I want a son. Why do you think that is? An heir. An heir? Yeah. So in ancient Near East, in the time of judges, uh, like it or not, what was more valuable? The husband probably would have wanted a son. She was barren. She was suffering. She was taking a ridiculing all the time, being provoked by this woman. Who knows? I don't know. But she did indeed ask for a son. Yes. Kent. Just notice the, the uh, state of her heart. She's not saying, God, give me this child so that I can stop all this affliction. Stop this lady from picking on me all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So basically he was saying that she wanted a child not because she wanted to stick it to Panina. She wanted one for her own for her own suffering and to glorify God, yes. Wow. Of course, of course. He said she is bargaining, but it has to do with the state of her heart. She's not, uh, she's uh, seemingly does, doing it with a pure heart, wanting to serve God, and God's going to do what he wants. You know, he can turn a, uh, an unworthy offering for his glory if he wanted to. Yes? Just put it out there. Just put it out there. Well, it was, yeah, and Janet's making the case that uh, because the author put in all this about Panina's ridicule of her, that there was some aspect to her that wanted, of course, wanted to stop and would 
you know, this would be the way by having a son. Uh, I think there's merit in that, in the fact that the whole point is to show the deep, horrible suffering of Hannah. So it wasn't just that if barren isn't, being barren isn't bad enough, I've got this ridicule and provocation because of it. So it, it all added to her suffering, and we come to this fever pitch where she can take it no longer. She, in her weeping and grief, she just lays before the door of the Lord's tabernacle and empties her heart praying, uh, even vowing to give a gift back to the Lord if he would give her the gift. So true. All good thoughts. Do you think that would be a hard vow to keep, moms? Yes, yes. Unless that was your intention to begin with. Unless that's where her, her intention was from the beginning. That she didn't really care about the other girl as much as she wanted to do more for God for her child. Okay. Or show God's power and glory that he can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe she wanted to show her how faithful her God was and how powerful her God was. Maybe. So y'all hear that? Do I gotta repeat all that? She bas- they basically said it wouldn't be hard if that was her intention the whole time. She wanted to show how glor- how powerful God is to be able to open her womb and do this miracle. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we, you've all known like women, women who uh, decided to place the baby up for adoption and then changed their mind because of, and she's going to keep Samuel for three years, weaning him before, or at least three years, around three years. We don't know exactly how long. It, I think it might, it might have been a hard vow to keep, if, especially if that bond of love started to grow. I don't know. I'm getting way off topic, though. (laughs) All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Verse 12 and 13. Here we go. As she continued praying before the Lord. So Hannah's laying down, um, praying. I say laying down. She's bowed herself before the door of the tabernacle. Eli is standing at the post doing what Eli did. Uh, She continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Of course. Now take note of how Hannah's praying. So remember, put yourself in the time. Put yourself in the place. We're at the time of the festival, the time of the feast, the time where everybody comes to Shiloh to worship the Lord. Hannah was not, this is my opinion, I can't prove this from the text, so take it for what it is. Hannah was not praying as others might have prayed when they came before the door of the tabernacle of the Lord's house, especially during these feasts. She wasn't speaking with loud declarations and making showy statements. In fact, more than likely, this was the time of the sacrificial meal, so everybody would be eating the sacrificial meal, and here's this lone woman And she was so intimate with God that she prayed in her heart, knowing that God would hear her prayers. Uh, Only her lips moved, it says, as she poured out her heart. And you can get that. You can really sense the picture of this grief-stricken, suffering woman uh, bowed down, pouring her heart out, uh, speaking to God with her heart, with her mind, and, and mouthing the words with her lips. Uh, you really get the sense that she came to the God with whom she had a personal relationship with. She wasn't making showy, showy, flowery things in front of the tabernacle as so many other people throughout history have done. Um, And it shows us that we're also able to come to God like that. You can come to him in all of your grief, in all of your suffering, with all of your tears, with all of your afflictions, For the God of the universe is intimately involved in each of his children's lives. So seeing this, and this is why I say it was not normal, because seeing this scene in front of the door of the tabernacle, it doesn't seem to have crossed Eli's mind that this woman could be praying or seeking the Lord or or crying out to God. 
the spiritual leader of the nation at this time is unable to discern the prayerful suffering this woman's going through. He thought, he, he thought she was a woman who had gotten drunk at the evening sacrificial feast and was here just mumbling to herself. And when he sees it, he rebukes her. And, and why, do you think, why do you think this would be such a strange scene to Eli? You're the priest of Israel. You're the, supposedly the priest on duty. You're standing right here by the doorpost uh, of the tabernacle. And here comes this woman who falls down, is probably rocking back and forth, weeping bitterly, it says. And she's uh, no doubt in a position of prayer. And it doesn't dawn on you that she's praying. Why would that be so abnormal? Why would he think that she was drunk instead of praying? Frank? Eli's heart's far from the Lord, is that what you said? His heart is what and he's far from the Lord? Oh yeah, heart and spirit are far from the Lord. Yeah, I don't agree with, I mean I agree with that 100% because we're going to see Eli, he, he, God really takes it to him over how he's uh, not rebuking his sons. But also, the nation is a bunch of people who do whatever's right in their own eyes. So this was not a normal thing. And so when he sees it, he doesn't recognize that this woman's suffering, that she's praying, that she's pouring her heart out to God. And then in, in verse 14, like I said, he rebukes her. He said, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. So knowing what we know about Eli allowing his sons to sleep with the women who came to sacrifice and pollute the people's offerings by taking what they desired of the meat. Boy, Eli sure is indignant when it comes to a woman having too much to drink, isn't he? Jason, wasn't it traditional for the Israelites to stand and pray out loud? Yes, that's exactly right. It was traditional for the Israelites to stand and pray out loud. So he didn't recognize when she... Did it say she fell down and prayed? It doesn't. So maybe she was standing and praying. I don't know. Good point. See, I, I've been in the, the prophetic stuff so long, I'm missing all kinds of things in the narrative. So this simple woman, afflicted with barrenness, torn with grief, she explains herself to this priest. She says, But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Hannah, of course, humbly explains, ain't had nothing to drink, but her heart is in a state of despair, what she calls vexation. She explains that she's here pouring out her heart to the Lord. Maybe which is something Eli hadn't seen in a while. Hearing her desperate state and the reason that she's here before the tabernacle, I think Eli realizes that, hey man, this is the reason you're here. He, he's supposed to represent God to the people and he's supposed to represent the people before God. So he responds in verse 17 by saying, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. There's a lot of discussion about whether he said, oh, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. May God grant you your, or whether he's just going, eh, okay, God grant you your, you know, whether it's flippant or whether it's actually heartfelt. There's good arguments for both sides. What do you think? I mean, he may have said it what? Kindly. Kindly. Maybe. It could be that he recognized Yikes, she's seeking the Lord. It's my job. I'm responsible. He should have been embarrassed. <laughs> he should have been embarrassed. Well, mistaking a woman prayerfully and sorrowfully pouring out her heart to God for a drunk lady, that's probably pretty embarrassing for this priest of Israel. So he offers this kind of wish prayer dedication may God of Israel grant your petition that you have made of him may God give you what you've asked um, but he does bless her all the same in essence may the Lord give you what you've been asking for and here you see this is where I wanted to get to and I probably should have read the whole chapter at the first but this is where I want to get to because at this point you see the heart of faith that Hannah has 
Because it says in 18, she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. Why was her face no longer sad? She had peace. Did she have a child? Did she have any prospect of having a child? Has she been given anything by God? Peace. Peace and faith. Yeah. So she gives Eli respect. You know, let your servant find favor in your eyes. But she hadn't been granted anything yet. She's not pregnant. She has no son. She has no reason to assume that she will have a son. Yet all the same, after pouring her heart out to God, she goes away with a different heart. She goes away with a different countenance than when she came. She she goes away with faith. Why do you think that she had faith just after pouring her heart out to God, hearing what Eli said, even if he is not the greatest guy, hearing his blessing of her, may the Lord grant you. Why do you think that made a difference? Because she had the faith going into that prayer. The same reason we get peace in prayer, God's peace. The same reason we get peace from prayer, because God's peace. Isn't that what it says, you know? In your, don't be anxious, but in all things, prayer and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding. She'd been talking to God, how do we know he didn't answer her? She'd been talking to God, we don't know if he answered her. He said, how do we know that he didn't answer her? Uh, nothing's in the text, for sure. But she did. We do know that she walked away with a peace she didn't have when she came. Huh? And she, and she ate. That's what I mean. Is So it's not just, I feel better. But she gets up from her weeping and praying. And she goes back to the family at the sacrificial meal. And she was no longer sad. Even... Presumably, none of this is in the text, this is all my opinion, but presumably looking across the table from Panina, Panina, whatever her name is. <laughs> she had the peace that passes understanding because God was with her. She poured her heart out to God. And whether it was audible or not, God did answer her. God was still God to her, regardless of whether he was going to grant her request in the way she wanted or not. He has given her this peace that passes understanding. And then it says, they rose early in the morning. We're going to blow through these last few verses. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. And then they went back to the house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So God not only heard her request... He remembered her, it says. Doesn't, when the Bible says God remembered his covenant or remembered someone like that, it doesn't mean he had forgotten and said, oh yeah, Hannah. It means that he acted in uh, remembrance of his word or a remembrance of his faithfulness. He acted in such a way that he brought his word or will to pass. Um, and just as she, she prayed, he remembered her and she bore a son. You know, Hebrews 11, 6 said, God rewards those who diligently seek him. It was by God's grace that she conceived. It wasn't a payment for her devotion or her works or any of that stuff. And she calls his name Samuel. Samuel sounds like, there's some, there's some discussion and some debate about this, but the word Samuel in Hebrew sounds like the Hebrew word for ask. Ask of the Lord. So... It sounds like that, but there's other people that say it's taken from the word Shem, uh, which means name. So in that case, it would be the name of the Lord. A lot of debate, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I think it is because it sounds like the word ask because of what Hannah says when she dedicates the child. And we'll see that in a minute. It says, The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. I'm going to give him as I vowed to give him, but I'm going to wean him first. And that day we're talking, you know, two, three, four years old. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. 
So Elkanah's faithfulness is seen here even when it means you're going to give up this child. So he says, he says you, you do what seems good to you. You have the child wean, but we're going to make sure that the Lord establishes his word, meaning he is going to be dedicated to the Lord. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she had weaned him. So finally, these last few verses, it says, And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. She brings the sacrifices to properly dedicate him to the Lord, presents him before Eli, and then she reminds Eli of who she is. We're, we're years down the road now, at least a couple. And it says, and she said, oh, my Lord, as you live, she's talking to Eli, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord, given him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Now, it doesn't come across great in the ESV, but like three times in that, that um, speech, she uses a form of the word asked. So for this child I prayed, the Lord has granted, he has granted me my petition that I made to him. Uh, and, and so I think that Samuel means I have asked of the Lord, but I'm not willing to die on that hill. So Samuel gives to the Lord, Samuel, uh, sorry, Hannah gives Samuel to the Lord in fulfillment of her vow. She re re remembers her cry and her vow. She uses the same words to Eli that he said to her. May the Lord grant your request to you that you ask. She echoes those words right back to him as she reminds him of who she is. She says, the Lord has given me the request that I've asked. And from now on, it literally says, he is made over to Yahweh. He's given over to Yahweh. So in a real sense, she's giving her son to God. He will, from this point on, remain with Eli. Uh, Elkanah and Hannah, uh, their devotion and godliness is further illustrated by, by how they respond after they receive the blessing. Both he, the husband, and Hannah uh, did not go back on the vow that they made before God when God blessed them with his son or the vow that Hannah made before God. Uh, a lot of people today, and we all have this tendency, uh, turn to the Lord in suffering and grief and affliction and all of the things that go along with this life. And we turn to him in, in need and with vows and promises. But yet when the suffering and grief take hold, we tend to, I tend to be just like the Israelites. Oh God, deliver me from this oppression. Okay, here's a judge raised up is going to deliver you. And then here I go right back into idolatry. But what you don't see is this in Elkanah and Hannah's life. The same thing that was the opposite that was going on with the time of the judges is not what you see with them. They, uh, they didn't forget their worship, their devotion, their promise to the Lord. Um, Hannah does not hold on to the gift that God gave her and not honor and love the giver of the gift. Does that make sense? She values the giver more than the gift, which for a mother and a child is a big thing. Um, remember now, she's not, it's not like she's never going to see him again, but he doesn't live in her house anymore. She's going to have access to him. She's not abandoning him. Um, she's giving him over to God. But you got to imagine how hard that would be. Especially a little kid. Like, I don't trust my 15-year-old by herself, much less a three- or four-year-old. Yet, it is through, here's the point, we'll be done. It's through grief and through suffering, through affliction, through hardship, through who knows how many years Hannah had suffered through all of this, not to mention the persecution, not to mention all of the things that brought her to this place of just utter despair and helplessness where the only thing she knew to do was go and, and call out to the Lord 
Um, it was through this that God chose, I'm going to raise up my judge. I'm going to raise up my deliverer. You can say it that way. Uh, through Samuel and through him, I'm going, to, I'm going to guide my people Israel in this critical time up to the establishment of King Saul. So, long story short, we always talk about, you know, God works all things for good. And let me tell you something. That's an easy thing to say when you're not the one suffering. When you're not the one who just lost a loved one. Or when you're not the one facing a, a, a very risky surgery or whose children are you know, whatever. Uh, and I would never, and you shouldn't either. Like when we, that is true. And that is theologically right, biblically right. And God is working all things for good. Uh, but you don't run up in somebody's face who's suffering and say, hey, don't worry, God's going to work everything for good. But in our hearts, when you, when you peel back the grief and the suffering and the affliction, that it, you just have to go through it. I mean, there's no words that can make it go away. There's nothing that can ease it. When you peel all of that back, there's got to be this little center where there's, there's hope. And as, as God works, that hope grows. And so God takes this woman who is torn and broken and at the end of her rope and grief stricken in more ways. You know, we hear it, we say, well, she couldn't have children. And to, today that's not a big deal to us. But to her, it was everything. And it was just such a, a, a suffering and a, a time of trial in her life. And it's through this one. Not the happy, happy people all over, not the people that are doing what's right in their own eyes. It's through this faithful, suffering, heartbroken woman that God chooses to work. God makes, uh, God's strength is perfected in our weakness. So, overarching storyline, it's really just the birth of Samuel. But when you zero in, and God is going to use all your pain. He's going to use all your suffering. He's going to use all of your affliction because unlike Hannah, in the midst of all of these Israelites that did whatever was right in their own eyes, we as children of the king under Jesus Christ, we are all kings, a kingdom of priests. And God is using you in glorious ways that you probably won't ever even realize until we see him face to face. So even in the affliction, even in the suffering, even in the heartache, you have to grieve and there's nothing wrong with grieving, but there's hope there. Questions, comments, cries of outrage? Okay. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I'm uh, not real sure of not real sure that I walk through it the best way, God. I pray that you would just use um, your word and what you accomplished through Hannah and Elkanah and eventually through Samuel. Um, and God, that you would remind us of um, the fact that at one time or another in this life, we will all go through affliction and suffering and trial and grief. It is a surety. And God, while we, we are not promised that you will relieve that suffering in this life, we hold fast to the reality that you have promised that you will relieve the suffering. God, when we look forward toward eternity, we know that we will live forever with you. It will be a new heaven, a new earth, and we will truly be alive without pain, without suffering. So, God, while we are gracious, um, we are uh, uh, grateful for your graciousness, God, we pray that you would help us to see your glory and your gifts, even in the midst of our suffering and grief. Help us to grieve with those who grieve, to come alongside those who suffer. Help us to be who you've called us to be. And, God, grow that hope within us that will see you for who you are as our treasure. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey.